can barely hear you, buddy. Can you hear me now? Yeah, get your head out of the water there in the hot tub. Turn the bubbles off. I think I hear you as good as we're going to hear you. I'm going to bless and release. Okay. Welcome to another episode of Dishonorable Mention. Joining us as always, communication specialist, Dr. Carla Mastracchio. Say hello, Carla. Hello. Also joining us as always, we missed her last week, but she's back this week. Communications Director for Ruthless. Say hello to Becca Teeter. Hello, Becca Teeter. And as always, joining us from the right, State Representative Chris Latvala. Say hello, Chris. Because he usually is right. Hello, guys. How are y'all? <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. And as always, I am Ernest Hooper, a friend of Tampa Bay, and we're excited to have another dynamic podcast. We have some special guests coming up a little later. First, can we talk a little bit about current events? Can we? Can we? Can we? Yes. You know what's happening that I will be watching later is the Broadway show Jagged Little Pill is going to be streaming on Facebook tonight starting at 8 p.m., is that oh, from Alanis so Morissette? Yes, and it's supposed to be yes. exceptional. It it's it's it is nominated or was nominated for a bunch of awards. It's it's supposed to be the show if Broadway was open to see. <laughs> so now I you mean, can. she's amazing. I do find it a little weird that she wrote Jagged Little Pill after Dave Cotier, which does not seem like he's worthy of is that, that type of music. Full House. Yes, yes, it doesn't. See, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a roll here. But I mean, it's, that means there's hope for like you know tubby goofy guys. Hey, he may have the sweet moves. I don't know. He's a stand-up comedian, so I'm sure there's something redeeming about him. Yeah, well, I don't think she's ever actually know. confirmed that though. But she was with him for so long. Who else could it be? I think it'd be somebody she wasn't with for so long. Really? I would really like to hang that? out with her. Why do you think that? That's very interesting to me. Why do you think that it would be something she has it, someone she has not known for a long time? I think it was deeply passionate and she was misled. And six weeks later, she was scorned. So she wrote an entire album about somebody she met for six weeks. Yeah, she was young. Life happens. That's a very interesting theory. I I always thought it was about Dave because they were together for so long. But <laughs> well, that's what people say, you know. I mean, I'm just trying to go against the grain. You're such mm. a contrarian, Becca. I do what I can, keeping it spicy. Hooper, we made a commitment while you were um, on assignment, and 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 we were waiting for you to join us. That we're going to have an episode, not tonight, because we're all feeling a little salty. But it's going to be kindness where we can only say nice things no matter what anybody brings up. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, we are a uh, we are a salty bunch. So I know it's going to be a challenge. I didn't that used could, to be we, salty. We could do it right after the election. Oh, I'm going to be in a great mood, so that's fine. And uh, Becca will be crying in her wine. Well, first of all, I don't feel I don't feel seen here because I don't drink wine, except for very rarely. Wine. Well, you'll be drinking wine on election night whenever I'm telling you that the world is not going to end in Trump's second term. Yeah, oh I, my gosh. You know, um, that is a statement you'll have to make to a lot of people, Christopher. Well, I did it last time he won. I told him that the world wasn't going to end. And so far, I've been proven right. So. Oh. It, that's like somebody who's hanging on by the brink and the thread is going and going and you're like, hey, but it's all good. No, we are not OK. Two words. Murder hornets. OK, that's all you need to know about 2020. And what, what's Joe Biden going to do about that? Nothing. Well, he's at least shown some successful leadership before. And not maybe run like 40 years ago. Oh, my gosh, you are delusional. And the fact that, you know, this is going to be I hope you have you need we talked about Carrie Getz earlier. You need to have Carrie do some acting training for the Republican Party so you guys can learn to keep a straight face when you talk about his accomplishments. 
no, the next I, six I, months is going to be no, different. No, sa- I've said that Joe Biden was generally, from what I know of him, to be a good man. And the stories that I've heard about him, and and I don't know if I've ever told you a story, but I had a friend who since passed away, but uh, he worked in Washington as like a staffer or a, a, just a run-of-the-mill lobbyist. And back when Joe Biden was in the Senate, he used to take the uh, train back to Delaware every night to spend, you know, with his family. He never lived in Washington. And um, and my friends would be on the train with him on a regular basis, and they developed a friendship. And my friend was a big, you know, Republican, but he couldn't compliment Joe Biden enough about what kind of, you know, man and nice man he was and – and just kind to, you know, run of the bill people. So I think generally he's a, you know, probably a nice guy and a nice, you know, man. But that doesn't mean he should be the president. Well, he was good to be vice president. So I'm going to go with, let's give him an upgrade. And I'm going to second Carlos' motion. Hearing no objections, <laughs> I say that passes. <laughs> Can we afford to splice in Beyonce's upgrade or no? Can we not afford that? Okay. We all want you to imagine that song playing right now or sponsor a future episode and you can make it happen. Hey, Hooper, what's going on at the uh, Cancer Society? Uh, good things. Good things as always. But I was going to ask you guys, how many of you believe that President Trump is taking hydroxychloroquine? Well, one of two things are happening. Either he has it and is taking it or he's lying. Because if you take it and you don't have it, it could make you really sick. And he's kind of old. So I don't know that he would take the risk. Yeah, I, 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 Carl, I'm just not convinced that uh, he's doing that. I, I think this is another red herring to distract us from other issues so or he could just be a little bit senile and is talking out of his ass and said something he shouldn't have otherwise known as a lie (laughs) i mean i don't know why you would think he might be lying he has such a track record of clear consistent communications that never change or falter (laughs) I don't know. It just doesn't make sense for him to be taking hydroxychloroquine. Well, I mean, you can take it and be out. You can take it and be okay. But if you're in the demographic where you know it might not react well, I mean, you could get really sick. I know people that have taken that for malaria, and it's a. It, you can be okay. A lot of people are okay, but I mean, a lot of people aren't. It's rough on your body, and at his age, I mean, no offense, but he's not exactly the picture of health. Well, I don't know. One of the big headlines today. Another is that a company in Massachusetts is making progress on a vaccine. Mm-hmm. How excited are you guys to hear about um, that advancement? Well, I think they're moving into stage two clinical trials. Is that right? Or is that, am I not right yeah. about that? Okay. I mean, I think that's good. I think we're throwing a lot of money at this thing which might make the road to treatment, whether that looks like a vaccine or something else, um, a lot faster. So I have faith that our ability to be team players with each other and, you know, be innovative and harness that spirit of like entrepreneurship and, and really try to help the world. Like I'm very optimistic when it comes to that. Um, so I'm excited about anything that's involving phase two. Tell me this. I was on a call last night, and then Hooper can take us back to topics of significance. But there was a question, and there was sort of a runaway answer. Who do you like more or love more or team whatever, Michael Jackson or Prince? Hooper, you go last. Chris? Well, neither one of them are necessarily my jam. But if I had to consider the whole um, person, I would say Prince because Michael Jackson had some other uh, issues uh, that would disqualify him, I would think. Excellent. Thank you for sharing, Carla. 
as people, although both are kind of problematic in terms of the way they treated other people. I don't love the way um, Prince treated a lot of women that he took under his wing. And I obviously don't love the way Michael Jackson abused young boys. So there's that. But if you just had to look at music, I'd probably say Michael Jackson. And the tipping point for me is that one scene in center stage where she dances to the way you make me feel, which is one of the greatest dance movies of all time and greatest dance scenes of all time. And every time that song comes on, I have to play it in its entirety. The end. I I would like you to find that clip and put it on our social (laughs) channels. It's so there's a gif about it. We can put the gif up. What movie are we talking about? Center stage. Oh my God. I can't even with you right now. Center stage. First yeah, movie, I never saw and now it. you don't know what center stage is. I love a dance movie. Oh my god, it's the greatest dance movie of all time. Fight me. Better than Footloose? Oh, way better. <sighs> I love better dance movies. Dirty Dancing. D- dirty Dancing is good, but it doesn't have as many dance scenes as you really think it does. Now, center stage, almost every scene is a dance scene. And it has some really cool people and amazing dancers from the New York City Ballet and Ed- American Ballet Theater, et cetera, et cetera. What is the greatest dance movie of all time? Jenner's Age. I what don't. I'm. Age? I'm. I mean, what was really... the cheerleading movie from like the early 2000s? Bring, Bring it, it on. on. It's that the greatest movie. movie. That is a great. That is um. That is. That's in my spirit. No, that's an amazing film, and and uh, Kristen Dunst is just a Gen X hero. And I am obsessed. <laughs> and there it's was not another. A movie. It's a there movie. was another movie, but I forget the name of it. It had the ball headed black guy as the lead actor. Oh, um, say and the then last, the blonde the girl dance. was the actress. Um, say, is it say the last dance. Maybe. Yeah. yeah if you watch, that. if you watch the last scene, first of all, I can go. I mean, I. I if y'all really want to talk this through, we can totally talk this through. But it is such a racist film. And it's like, you know, like the white girl goes into like the black inner city community and she's discriminated against. But yet she borrows black hip hop culture to get her into Juilliard. If you watch that scene with the sound off where she is auditioning for Juilliard, it is the funniest thing and there are people on twitter the other day that pulled up that movie it was on tv and live tweeted it and played it with the sound off on twitter like clips of it and it was just laughable that's why i'm more into zach attack myself zach attack was great oh my were the hot sundays I was about to say, we can't forget the hot Sundays. Hey, so Hoop, you're going to go, I mean, we know how much you love music, but Michael Jackson, that's where you're going to land, right? It's a difficult choice. I would say uh, I would lean uh, ever so slightly towards Michael Jackson only because uh, his music uh, has broader appeal and has has proven to be uh, a little more uh, timeless, just slightly more timeless than Prince. I mean, if you're a DJ and you have, and, and, and I say, play one song to get everyone on the dance floor and I will give you $100,000. You could play 1999 by Prince, but I think if you play Don't Stop Till You Get Enough by Michael Jackson, you're going to win that $100,000. Ooh, you it's might be right. an incredibly bad. infectious song. And, <laughs> uh, it just, and, and it just, you know, for whatever reason, maybe, maybe you know, because uh, Prince is edgier, uh, uh, Michael's music has uh, transcended, uh, has done a better job of transcending generations than Prince has. Uh, People from my generation continue to love Prince. I continue to love Prince. But if you talk to my kids, uh, they're going to be much more familiar with Michael Jackson uh, than they are the music of Prince. That is interesting. I am going to reach across the aisle and side with Chris. I'm going Team Prince. So it's a split, folks. It's a split. That's... 
but who knew Prince was going to bridge would be one of the bridge issues for us. <laughs> oh gosh, that and we really know what happened to Jeffrey Epstein. Um, yep. Hey, there, uh, it's going to be on Discovery ID too. Are we on that again, huh? Well, because he listen. killed himself, who or because he was murdered, he didn't yeah. kill himself. I know it was terrible. He lured himself into the prison from a helicopter. <laughs> Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible. I know. I know. I'm starting to think any of this stuff is possible. Can we talk about an issue that I would really love your opinions on? And assume, of course, you know, things could not be as they seem. Things are not always, you know, details are still forthcoming. I don't want to say this is absolute, but the story that was reported on and broke last night that um, the chief data scientist was fired for insubordination because she, uh, for for the state because she said she would not doctor data and access. And again, this is um, innocent until proven guilty. But um, from the Florida Department of Health, the data scientist Rebecca Jones. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, well, it's 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 a story that continues to feed a narrative, whether you believe it or not, it's up to you. But it continues to feed a narrative that Governor Ron DeSantis and his administration are somehow, uh, as we like to say, cooking the numbers to give the appearance that the coronavirus has not impacted Florida as bad as it has. Uh, there's been a couple of stories uh, suggesting that. Uh, this is just the latest. Previously, there was a fairly extensive discussion about uh, the governor telling the medical, the state medical examiner to stop releasing numbers and that the numbers would come from uh, his office. That raised eyebrows of whether, you know, uh, that's to be believed or not, uh, I think is going to require more evidence than what we have right now. And that's why I'm not going all in on it, because people can make claims and they may not be true. But if there is some truth to that, that's some scary business. Well, I think if you I mean, I didn't read the entire article, but my husband and I were talking about it. So I want to make sure that everyone knows that it read the whole thing. Um I'm pretty honest when I read something in its entirety when I don't. And this is one of the times where I don't. But he was saying that he was reading things, um, articles that said that what she was asked to do was it was a couple of columns asking something about how people get sick and when people started feeling sick. It wasn't like numbers on hospitalizations. It wasn't numbers of deaths. It wasn't anything like that. It was more on symptoms and things like that. And that's what she was asked to take out in a couple of those columns. And she refused so I think I think it's easy to read a headline and be like, oh, of course Florida's cooking the books because we don't we don't have the same numbers that we should have. Well, and it, it really does feed into a narrative. But I think if you I don't know, I feel like you need to look at everything in context. I'm not saying anyone that on this I, podcast is doing that. I'm just saying in general. No, and, and I did read the article. And, and one of the things that concerned me oh, better than me. that, you know, she's alleging that, you know, certain things, very specific things, but also um, some of the data that she had been reporting on how it's more adversely affecting specifically minority communities, um, she was being asked to suppress information like that. And I think, again, all of this is just allegedly, but if that's true, that's a I mean, that, among other things, is a real problem, because if it's more adversely affecting different population groups and there's reasons why, number one, that's important information. And number two, it there, there's a lot of different narratives that could be written there, but none 100%. of them are good. hundred percent, Becca. I completely agree with you on that. I just think. I, for me, my benchmark is going to be available hospital beds and ICUs and deaths. 
So, I mean, because we we're not going to have adequate testing. We're just not. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, um, much of which I think could have been prevented, but that's another conversation for another day. But if we don't have, in the absence of testing and looking at data, because we all know you can make data do whatever you want, I think that we need to look at how many people are in the ICU, how many people have died, and how many people are in the hospital, and how are they being treated. So, and from what areas and what demographics, I think that you can break down in a way that's meaningful, um, much more meaningful than, you know, and, and again, this is a question for Paul, because we're going to have a chief data scientist on, on pod in a few minutes. So, I mean, but there's different ways you can crunch numbers and there's different ways you can make numbers do what you want. So. I want somebody to do what I want. Seriously, I was just I was just thinking that. I was like, God, if I can make <laughs> people do what I wanted, like the way I can make numbers do what I want, like man, that's a superpower. I, mean, I think on an overall basis, you know, there is surprise that Florida is doing as well as we are. Um the I I believe it was the Orlando Sentinel that wrote an article the other day and, and called Florida lucky. Um, and so when, when, you know, something is going well, we're lucky when something's going bad, it's Ron DeSantis' fault. Yeah, I actually agree with you on that, Chris, and I hate um, that. And, yeah, that right. you, you know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to speak on this particular instance because I do not know all the facts. Um, his, the governor's office, I believe press secretary, late this afternoon, said that there was multiple um, examples of insubordination with this woman. Um, and, you, you know, and so, um, you know, if they had a valid reason to fire her, then, you know, so be it. Um, you know, when, when numbers are being uh, manipulated, you know, that would be a concern. But the fact remains that we're not um, uh, New York, we're not California. Um, we're in a much better position, um, you know, unlike North Carolina, Ron DeSantis wasn't sending COVID-19 patients into nursing homes. You know, he wasn't telling people in the beginning of March that it was safe to ride, you know, subways like they were in, in New York. And so, you know, there's a lot of well, things. Well, that's because Rick that, Scott took away all our money for public transit, so we don't but, have any for people to get. But, but my, my, my point is, Becca, is... You know, th there's a lot of things that Florida has done right. And, you know, we're just being called lucky. And, you know, now they, you, you know, and, and then they get on them about testing. Well, we could all be tested today, you know, be cleared and then tomorrow get it. So you would literally have to test the entire population every single day of the week. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I, I certainly support more testing and I certainly support, um, especially testing in our, um, vulnerable populations. My grandma, um, is 90 years old and lives in a nursing home. Um, she had a, um, a COVID-19 patient in her nursing home where she lived. So you better believe I was wanting every patient where she lived to, to be tested. Um, and, and frontline, you know, workers, you know, like cops and, and firefighters or, or um, uh, EMTs and, and um, nurses and doctors should be tested on a regular basis. Um, you know, but, um, you know, and I think we're getting at that point because, you know, professional, um, professional sports are able to test people on a regular basis. Uh, the UFC can test um, their fighters out of Jacksonville on a regular basis, and they're running multiple fights every week. And so I think we are getting, you know, more. To, and as we're testing more people in Florida, the positive um, rate is going down. But you don't hear about that. Um, and so, you know, it's, um, you know, it's very one sided when, you know, Ron DeSantis and, and, and Florida is called lucky when something good happens, but when something bad happens, i.e., the websites, you know, that's a piece of crap that he inherited is all his fault. Well, since we're talking about COVID 19 and about science and about what all the numbers mean, let's welcome a very special guest 
who can hopefully uh, illuminate this topic. Carla, would you like to introduce our guest, please? I would absolutely love to. Also, Paul, is uh, Yell on the show with you? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so I would love to introduce Dr. Paul Lieber and Dr. Yell Lieber. And Paul is a chief data scientist at Colsa Corporation, and Yell is a school psychologist. So they're here to talk about the importance of data and why numbers are important, and also what kids are going to be facing in the next coming months, and you know some of the issues that they're currently experiencing now as they deal with the trauma of not being able to go to school, see their friends, do the things they usually do. I mean, it's much harder on a child that can't, you know, reason like an adult than it is on, on us. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's the first question. I have a lot of questions for y'all, but I'll leave it to my co-hosts to uh, kick it off. Well, we were just talking about the latest story uh regarding a state official who may or may not have been, have been dismissed because, because she was, she was uh, allegedly cooking the numbers uh or, or allegedly was asked to fudge the numbers and refused so uh let me ask uh, uh paul there's so many different data points regarding COVID 19. Uh, how do we interpret it and uh, what numbers do you think are most important in assessing uh, where we are as a state and as a nation in our battle against COVID-19? Yeah, really good question. I, I think the, the biggest problem, and I'm biased because of my job description in, in COVID-19, is, is the data and the statistical modeling that's associated with it. Uh, in, in fact, from the get-go, the data has been all wrong because it was based on models and projections that were derived, you know, from a corrupt country whose very purpose was literally to hide the information, and they're still doing it. Uh, and as we look at the information here, too, uh, states are, are given incentive to over-report uh, COVID cases um, for federal funding. And likewise, um, just because you come up positive in a test doesn't mean anything. I, I often crack the joke, I guess, funny, not so funny, uh, so about, when, you know, we're all going to die of herpes someday, uh, if you understand my gist here. It's because what they're going to do is, you know, they'll test you for it, and everyone has some element of some strain within them. So the, the issue here is, in terms of the data that I trust, what I trust are individuals who are facing respiratory issues that do not have an underlying condition or a supporting condition that would mask itself or present itself as COVID. So if individuals are literally being hospitalized for respiratory conditions, it's not being you know pigeonholed or isolated after the fact into something, that data I trust. Um, and, and quite frankly too, it's these projections, these models, these reporting mechanisms, they're just invalid. Um, I'm sorry to be so bold in stating that, um, but they're they're invalid. Um, there's a huge initiative right now going on disinformation, misinformation by peer competitors that are trying to literally push information and numbers that are in, in designed to create chaos. At the end of the day, really, um, you know, I, I was listening to the you know the conversation just before this. You know, it's interesting about uh, the DeSantis numbers. You know, what do you believe? The truth of the matter is, you'd be very very hard pressed to find a single person who, quote, passed because of COVID that didn't have underlying symptoms related to respiratory or under or other serious conditions. So really, I don't trust any of the information with COVID. I don't think, honestly, that more testing is going to prove anything other than to put more money into the pockets of state governments that are, that are asking for federal funding for positive diagnoses. I'm sorry that may be a controversial statement, um, you know, it's it's unfortunately and fortunately, it's a very transmittable virus, but fortunately is not as potent as as we originally suspected. So, you know, I, I the models and projections, that's we don't even know when it started in the U.S. We don't even know what a proper diagnosis is. We don't know how long it sustains in the system. We don't know the treatment path. So honestly, I'm sorry I'm dodging your question, but I'm not. Uh, I really don't have much confidence in any of the information or any of the models that we have for COVID. And, and Paul, I want to like, clarify something. You study disinformation for a living. So uh, could you explain a little bit to our audience like what that is? Because some of the language that you've used, 
I'm sure some of the people that listen to the podcast are familiar with it, but some of them aren't. So like what you study disinformation, you study trends and numbers and data, but like what does a chief data scientist do? Really, really good question. Actually, I want to give a subtle correction. It's probably on me if you want to convey my title. My title is actually chief scientist of data and social science. And the reason why the social science point uh, correction is because of the fact that, um, you know, what you're talking about is really a social science more than a data science issue. Um, Disinformation, which is often confused with misinformation, is, is that actually a quite a, 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 um, an entirely different but related entity. So disinformation is when individuals, in this instance, it would probably be their masters at it, they invented it, would be Russia, trolling social media by providing an entire range of information uh, and also scopes of argument in which they could, you know, uh, control the frames of discussion. So a lot of times disinformation is uh, over... Um, you, you know, it, it's over attached or over related to politics. But the truth of the matter is, this information really doesn't have to do with politics. It, it, at the end of the day, it's a notion that if you can control the frames of discussion, you can control how people talk about this. And in COVID, we're seeing even something as simple as what great question, by the way, about the data and modeling. Um, What we're seeing is this information about how statistical modeling and projections and science works. So what that is, is there's an entity in this instance, it can be a uh, a country, it could be uh, a political party, it could be a nefarious actor of some sort that goes out there and wants to control the frames of discussion. So instead of trying to tell you what to think, they give you the whole range of arguments. They argue with themselves. They create these communities and bots and live people, and they destroy the entire playing field. So you're both the in-group and the out-group at the same time. And what it does is it creates chaos. Um, And so what you're seeing, Carla, to answer your question with COVID, a lot of the fear and a lot of the uh, paranoia that you're seeing is derived from excellent excellent disinformation in which individuals have been given the entire range of an argument and they and, and neither end is good. And so they're not really sure what to make of it. And social media is fantastic for that because what it does is it feeds on disinformation, unlike static media where individuals interact with each other and it's, it's all they're doing. It's like a campfire and they're just cooking more and more and more and more. And that, that fire that in which they're cooking is that disinformation. Does that answer your question? It absolutely does. Does it answer y'all's question, Boop, Becca, Chris? I'm obsessed I'm with you guys. This, I mean, I am dazzled. I feel like you came in like a rocket and just dropped, like you're like bringing knowledge bombs. I don't know if I feel better, worse, or just blown away by that cyclone of information. But man... I'm going to have to listen to this like six times so I can fully comprehend it all. There is a lot to unpack, I think. So I kind of want to go back, Paul, to a conversation that you and I had a while back when we were talking about the uh, last election cycle. And do you remember when you and I were talking and you're like, yeah, absolutely. I knew Trump was going to win. And it's because we were looking at social media amplification. Do you remember that conversation? 100%. Could you explain that? How did you know Donald Trump was going to win when all of the numbers said he wasn't and everybody said that Hillary Clinton would, you know, take states like Michigan? You know, it's, it's, you know, the the point on that, and I'm really glad uh, you brought that up. And by the way, I'm preceding that how, um, how your colleague explained, you know, in terms of, you know, what to think and what to make of it. The good news is I tell folks who are introduced to disinformation for the first time, or maybe they really explore it, is the good news is, is that your sentiments and how you're perceiving something are probably spot on. And that if you isolate your opinions and your knowledge and and honestly your feelings too about something, your gut instinct, it's usually pretty correct. So I I would say if you can do that, the good news is, is you're smarter than you think. Um, Back to Carla's question about uh, politics and the election, and we know it's it's been documented, um, you know, whoever political party you want to go with. I, I, again, I, I'm one of those people that I, I don't really I'm registered independent. You Google me, you'll see it in the Florida logs uh, intentionally, because uh, honestly, I, I, I see the disinformation going on in, in the discussion about the election. It was alive and well, the disinformation that is. 
and you were seeing extreme frames on both ends and how these things were being shaped, shaped and the, the argumentation that was going near. And it got to a point where it was obvious that the entire purpose of the discourse was to drive particular opinions and particular divides in social, in economic, and also in political sectors, of course, that the entire purpose was to create discord. And when you looked at this and you looked at the opinions being voiced, and this goes back to actually a mass communication theory, which is very salient disinformation called spiral of silence. It's based on social psychology. And it says that individuals who perceive themselves to be in the majority opinion are more likely to voice their opinion and vice versa for the minority opinion. And the more that they perceive themselves as such in one direction, then what you're going to see is, you know, that that effect will amplify. In the election, uh, you were seeing a mass mass slant uh, toward the direction of pro Hillary Clinton frames and biases. And quite frankly, they weren't necessarily even people. It was disinformation. It was bots. It was trolls. It was fostering conversation. But then when you started uh, looking at, you know, the American populace in terms of the overall sentiment, you were seeing an extraordinarily different picture. And so the individuals who felt because of the way that this information was being perpetrated uh, on online, they felt unsafe to speak. They felt that there was no point in speaking. And quite frankly, they said nothing. So if you look at a half of a population that feels they're not sure if they're the minority or the majority opinion, the only outcome they really had was to cast the ballot. And I'm not surprising that, that they went offline, they stopped talking about it, and there they went. Now, the next question you may ask, which I know you, Carla, quite well, so how is the, you see the future of politics and what's, what are we looking at up ahead? I would state that I have very little uh, confidence in, in polling. Uh, there's two different types of philosophies one can have in terms of looking at projected data versus you know, the overarching sentiment. But that was alive and well. It was the individuals with Trump, for especially in the last election, independent of the politics. You could say it's a protest vote or whatnot. But if you look at the social media landscape, it was very uh, fragmented toward one particular direction and theme frame of reference. And individuals stopped talking. When they stopped talking, the only action they had was to vote. And in the upcoming election, I got to tell you, social media is going to be, especially because of COVID and the disinformation, is going to be even less of a predictor of how it's going to go. The best way, again, what your colleague said is to figure out what people are going to vote or how they're going to vote. You just ask them and why. And if you're willing to have that conversation, you're probably going to get a much better reflection on how individuals reason. And I use that term reason, not feel about the political process. Does that answer your question? That is some heavy stuff. And it's true. So I think it's incredibly valuable that you are bringing kind of dropping this knowledge in the conversation, because a lot of our listeners probably don't know things like the spiral of silence. Like who would know that besides somebody who studies data and studies communication trends and disinformation and misinformation? So I think, you know, it's incredibly fortunate that we have you on on the show. And I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions from listeners. So be prepared because I might ask you, no problem. I might ask you back or I might ask you questions on, on a Facebook or Twitter. No problem. So did you meet your, obviously uh, we've read, read about both of y'all. Did you meet your incredibly brilliant partner at like a Mensa meeting or something? I mean, how did, how did, you know, this is clearly not only are you a power couple, but a brilliant power couple. Uh, we're so powerful. We met through online dating services. So there you have it. In Louisiana, when we both were working on our uh, our PhD, she went to the better school at Tulane, and I went to the one that has the football team at LSU. So that's that's how we met. So I can I can make it more exciting and indicate there was a, a big you know nefarious devious plan to take over the world one student loan at a time. But the truth of the matter is, <laughs> online dating it works. So you felt she was really honest and, and she was not presenting disinformation in her profile. I would say that the, the, the joke about it is I couldn't even see the you picture see in it. her profile because it was really blurry. I did um, it myself. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but I, I did, in fact, um, I liked the way she presented herself. And we chatted for months before we actually met in person, in all, in all fairness. So that was, was how we met. And according to her, all I did was endlessly talk about um, professional hockey. So it's not exactly a big mating ritual. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. There wasn't a lot of science exchanged. Um, but years later, we came to the discovery that she is by far the better statistician of the two of us. And I am more of the person that designs the uh, the instruments. So, the, uh, yeah, she is the 
She is the brains of the operation, definitely when it comes to numbers and understanding human reasoning. Uh, and also um, in terms of or her background is Carla uh, portrayed in terms of interventions and how to create mechanisms in which, you know, that you can, you know, that are valid for understanding statistical modeling and projection. Man, so, that's, a, that's a lot coming at me. What's your favorite hockey team? The New York Rangers. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I have lots of bad teams that I obsessively follow <laughs> and hope to not stick my poor two-year-old son with. Oh, well, one of my best friends is a super hockey fan and lives right up outside of the city. So that is why I was compelled to ask. Well, like, let's let's give your partner in life and not crime, except for crime of dismantling the lies that we're told to talk some about, you know, the other good doctor about some of her work, because I mean, I am, as a parent, I am fascinated, and I really want to go to a dinner party with you, both of you, frankly, but. <laughs> they are so be- interesting, I can't even tell you. Yeah, I mean, you did not over, you, you did not oversell, they are brilliant. Jeez, we're getting big heads. I know, my head just exploded. <laughs> I, I hit the low, the low hanging uh, fixture here. Keep in mind, it's, it's the not high ceiling, so don't worry about oh, it. Yeah. There you go. You pronounce your first name. It's not. How do you pronounce it? Sure, it's Yael. I, that's what I thought. Every uh, I have several friends that, that and, and they're all Israeli, and that's how they pronounce it. So I wasn't sure and wanted to clarify. Well, yeah. welcome. Tell us how you make the world better every day. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a school psychologist, so I work with kids. Uh, I work for Hillsborough, Hillsborough County Public Schools currently, and uh, I work with elementary school kids primarily right now. And so, I mean, the role of a school psychologist is kind of counseling and therapy and assessment. And I mm, primarily work with kids with uh, disabilities. So how has COVID kind of change the way that you work with children? I know that sounds, a, that's a really basic question, but as a non-parent, I'm so grateful to people who are taking care of our kids, because I think if we took care of the needs of every single child, we wouldn't have the problems we have in the world. So, I would, yeah. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's, it hasn't, it hasn't been good because we're not allowed any, um, you know, face-to-face contact. And as I said, I primarily work with kids with disabilities. So, you know, we have the e-learning environment we're using um, in Hillsborough County and, and throughout the nation, really. That's pretty much what people have gone to is virtual learning. It doesn't work terribly well for kids with disabilities. Uh, <laughs> some kids, it works okay with um, some kids, not not so much. But for things like therapy and counseling, it, it's not terribly effective with kids. Um, you know, the home environment isn't really set up, too, for learning for a lot of us, too. So there's just so many distractions, you know. And then I'm talking about young kids, so I work with pretty young kids, you know, 5 to 10. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard for them to maintain their focus and their attention on a Zoom meeting, you know, with 20 of their friends. <laughs> So it's been it's been a challenge. Let's just put it that way. What do you think parents need to know as we perhaps transition back to whatever normal is and, you know, both keeping kids stimulated this summer other than being in front of screens or what what should we be doing? I mean, I, school gets out in a, in a, a week. week, a week. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what. I, now I don't know what to do with myself. Like, I mean, I know what to do with myself. I don't know what to do with the people that I brought into this world. Yeah, no, I think I think it's really tough because at least you had the structure of, you know, the, the the learning lessons and things like that. And we are providing like summer school for some kids, but um, there's an awful lot of kids that aren't going to qualify for that. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I do think it's, it's tough. I mean, I think parents want to monitor a lot for like regression in kids, you know, emotional and behavioral regression as well as academic regression. And I think a lot of kids are fit with my son um, because you're trying to work simultaneously while having your kids at home with you. And also all the learning we provide is behind screens. So, you know, <laughs> it's rough, I think, right now. But I mean, I, I, I think just trying to get kids out basically, and trying to do more like learning as play is probably a, a really good method. 
um, for parents as the summer months go by, because there's probably not going to be a lot of offerings for summer camps and things like that uh, going on. So I think getting kids out there playing and just making learning about stuff fun is, is probably going to be really good. And as much as people can, trying to keep some type of routine. I mean, I think we say that to parents every summer, you know, and it's hard, but try to stay in some routine because when the school year comes back, right, then you have to get back into a routine. Well, that's even harder this year, right, because you've been out of school since March. And um, we don't know what it's going to look like going back into August. So, What are some of the possibilities? Like what in the decision tree – what are some of the options for going back? I've seen kids in France, um, you know, are going to have to wear little face shields. I've seen kids in China wearing like little mini hazmat suits. Like, it's a lot of stuff. So yeah. like, what can we expect? Yeah, you know, we're talking more about like the scheduling right now. Um, so there's been a lot of stuff thrown around. Like we might just continue e-learning. Ugh, there's that. Um, then there's kind of like the other option of maybe we'll go every other week. So the kids might go to school one week. I know half the kids in, in a school might go one week and the other half of the kids do e-learning and then you flip flop weeks. There's that idea. Then there's the idea of a half day, half the kids go from in the morning and then the other kids go in the afternoon that's being thrown around. And then there's shortened days people are talking about. I don't, so all of that's kind of on the table right now. And I, and I think all of that is really going to be complicated. <laughs> hey, I had a question. I was listening to a broadcast on NPR this evening, and Dan Harris, who is the uh, ABC anchor and a uh, something of an expert on uh, meditation and mindfulness, was saying that there's actually three crises taking place in the United States. Uh, there's a public health crisis, there's an economic crisis, uh, but he was emphasizing the one that's getting overlooked in his opinion, the mental health crisis. Uh, yeah, your yeah. perspective, do you think we're having a mental health crisis? And yes. Is it being overlooked? Yes, yes and yes, absolutely. And, and Paul, I, think, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that also, but go ahead, Doc, you, you go first, you're the expert. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, yeah, I think big time. I, I think we don't know what it is right now um, because people are still staying in their house and we're not seeing it yet. But I think, you know, we're not, you know, domestic calls on domestic violence, for example, are way down. Right. That's not because domestic violence just went away. You know, um, it's because the people that would report it that looked after people and paid attention and cared for people aren't in those people's lives anymore. Right. So um, a lot of calls to domestic violence hotlines are done by teachers, psychologists, social workers, right? We can't have contact with our clients, with our kids, you know, our other kids. Um, that's scary to me. Then on top of that, I mean, you have people who already had mental health problems that are not getting treatment because they're afraid to get treatment or they don't have access to a telehealth kind of form of treatment. Um, or telehealth just won't work for them, frankly. You know, like I was mentioning, a lot of people with disabilities, I mean, how do you do it effectively for some people? It it's, could be really complicated for people like, for example, with sensory impairments, it's, it's difficult. Um, and then on top of that, I think there's going to be a lot of people with a whole lot of OCD. I'm just throwing out there going on after this. They, they didn't have it before. They're going to have it now. <laughs> they were on the edge of it. And I think that's going to be a serious crisis with getting people back into just getting out of their house, being healthy, getting back to work, getting back to school, whatever. Because we've basically told people to be germaphobic at this point, right, in order to protect them. How do you kind of undo that? How much do we lose by not having a human touch? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm probably never going to, not not necessarily by choice, but I'm probably never going to shake hands with anyone again. Uh, everyone on the podcast knows I'm a hugger. Uh, <laughs> in Tampa, given its Latin roots, uh, depending on where you are, it's not uncommon to see a man and a woman kiss each other on the cheek. It mm -hmm. just seems like all of that's going away. Do, do we lose something in terms of uh, mental strength when we lose that human touch? The research on babies, you know, that like the longer that infants are held for, the, the higher their IQ. Now, that's correlational, but, you know, 
<laughs> human touch is pretty powerful, and there's been a lot of research studies on that in very young children. Um, you know that kids can develop, you know, um, what they would call reactive attachment syndrome, which is like a form of trauma syndrome from lack of physical contact. I can't tell you in adults, but yeah, <laughs> I think it's a great question. Yeah, I uh, I was telling uh, guys before once we come through this. It was actually my friend, friend Julie Weintraub who posted this, and I, I kind of agree with her. Once we get through this, the, the hugs are going to be uh, long and awkward, and they're going to be intentionally uncomfortable. People just have to deal with it. So, Like the domain hugs. Let's not go there. So as we kind of move on, uh, with each guest, we like to um, look up uh, what was the number one song on your 14th birthday? Because we here at Dishonorable Mention wholeheartedly believe that, that uh, whatever the number one song was on your 14th birthday totally defines uh, your life. Totally and completely. So if you guys could put your birthdays in the chat, um, I can look it up and tell you what the number one song was on your birthday. Can you do that for me? Yeah. She, mine's going to be like New Kids on the Block or something. Yeah. <laughs> we should be so lucky. <laughs> Same year? Yep. Wow. Oh, how lucky. Okay. That's interesting. Online dating. <laughs> <laughs> so who swiped right first? <laughs> well, you know, it's it, it wasn't as exciting back then. It was more like, uh, you know, uh, how many emails are we going to go back and forth before we actually communicate, uh, you know, in, in the crazy mode of phone conversation. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing if, to, if from back in, in the dinosaur age of online dating, that would be me. Oh, OK. Sorry. Oh, I, I, answered, I answered my first. birthday was All the Man That I Need by Whitney Houston. Ooh. Ooh. Look at you. That is the that is the song that defines your entire life. And the, for the August birthday. Oh, you got that one. Oh, no, that was mine. I was February. Oh. So yes. <laughs> All right. See. Uh and and August, it was uh Everything I Do, I Do It For You oh. by Brian. Brian. Oh, oh that that was my jam. That was my jam. That oh. was me and a girlfriend song in in like the fourth yeah. grade. Everybody skate one direction, couples only. Yeah, yeah. Hey, don't tell me it's not worth fighting for. That's a Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, like the worst movie ever made. Oh my god. <laughs> She's leaving. Legitimately, was, was the first Brian movie Adams. that I bought I did it three times. For I've seen Brian Adams three times in concert. I love the man. I do. Mm. I've seen Brian Adams three times in concert. Three times. He's amazing. He's he's like a bucket list. Like you have to see him before you die. Kind of. He's a seriously. He is right, Paul. Uh, no, I, I won't say he's a bucket list. I think list. he's a bucket no, list. No. He's amazing. He won't stop playing. Like he'll just play for like three, four hours. But you wish he'd stop. No, yes. no, you don't. He <laughs> 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 doesn't get much better after hour one. I just want to throw that out there. But he has a lot of energy. He's awesome. I like Brian Adams as well. So I, I, think, yell. I think Paul has a little Brian Adams envy because of his wife's clear passion. So I think he's spreading some disinformation. <laughs> no, Paul would never spread disinformation. Whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit here and do my Whitney and be left alone and, and just look, look glamorous. There you go. I, I respect that choice. Um, Christopher. Yo. Can you celebrate our great state as only you can? With a good Florida man story? Yes, you know please. it. Th this one's a good one, Ernest. It, it ranks up there with some of the dollar store ones that we had back in the day. Um, and for this one, there's more. I will accept more than one correct answer. All right. The title, Suspected Arsonist Leads, leads Chase Through Florida in General Lee replica, deputies say. So basically, this guy set fire to his ex-wife's house and then led deputies on a chase in a car that was decked out to look like the General Lee. 
Can you explain to listeners who may not know what the General Lee is? That was the car from the Dukes of Hazard, which was one of the greatest television shows ever from the late 70s and early 80s. <laughs> um, all right. So now we all guess on to where this story took place, right? Yes. And, and there's more than one correct answer because I will accept where the county in which it either happened or the county in which he was arrested at. Uh, it's got to be the Panhandle. I'm going to guess Jackson County. That's a solid guess. I'm going to guess you. Leon County. I'm going to go with Panama City. So that's Bay County. Good to know. Do our guests want to weigh in? Yeah, the, the guests, because we've had a guest that got one exactly correct before. I go with Escambia. Ooh. And, and if you want me, doctor, to give you a hint, I will. For the last uh, no hints. Answer. Uh, all right, no hints. All right. <laughs> These are brilliant people. They don't need a handout. Paul, uh, you take gonna, it again. You know, I'm going to do what any person who you know met their wife in online dating would do is agree with Escambia County. Ooh. Oh yeah. See, uh, I'm very Santa disappointed. Rosa, which is right next door, and really showed how you bookshelf each other. Go ahead, Christopher. I, I am very disappointed because I thought that y'all were going to get close and y'all weren't even in the ballpark. <laughs> uh, and whenever I said, you know, that Ernest had a solid guess, I was talking about the fact that he guessed Jackson County because that isn't too often guessed. The, the arson happened in Marion County and there was a high-speed chase where he was arrested uh, in Levy County. So it was kind of uh, close to us. So Why, of course. Levy County, home of Chief Lynn and Williston. Yeah, and, and usually we have a Marion or a Levy County guest. So I thought there was a chance that y'all might get it. One day. No, we, well, sold our, uh, we sold our General Lee two years ago and opted for a Honda. <laughs> <laughs> the windows of the baby. <laughs> yeah, we could we could slip 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 the kid into the car seat through you know through the through the window. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for joining us. Seriously, this was a delight. And yes, no, no, it was kind of kind of. I kind of want to keep talking, but maybe I kind of want to keep talking too. Finish. But I know these people have lives, so yeah, have I, I know. But I need more information, and not I know. And I also. I, especially closer to the election. I mean, I just, there's so much. I need AIL to hold me. I need, I need <laughs> Paul to tell me how it's going to be. I just, I need all the things. Um, I'll buy the wine for your tears, Becca. I feel like if any two of us die, the other two can replace us because we were talking about that before y'all came on the show. Man, well, I let's we not. Found our replacements. Well, we said they had to have a PhD. If it was, if, if you die. So there you go. Um, are we doing shout outs, guys? We're doing shout outs. Who's going first? Why don't we let our esteemed guests go? They'd like to thank the algorithms for online dating for the match. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to do the obvious shout out and thank Carla. my my much better half to the left of me and also oh. Carla, who I've actually oh. known for a decade. Yep. So for Carla, we've been in each other's shadows, sometimes uh, her in front of me, other times me in front of her, but always walking alongside. So thank Aww. you for the invitation. I love you both so much. I just think I'm so happy that you're able to come on the show. So I just, my shout out goes to the two of you because I just think that I love how having power couples on the podcast and I love you all. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, we didn't get your bride shout out. That's oh, there you go. Go ahead, yeah. God, trying to silence a woman, Paul. I thought so much more of you. <laughs> I was gonna take Carla, but I'll take all you guys. Aww. So thank you guys for letting us talk. It was fun. We're lucky that you're on. We, we, we enjoyed we're having you, Christopher. Yes, ma'am. So my shout out is to the graduating class, class of 2020, of Clearwater Central Catholic High School. Um, in Clearwater, uh, they have uh, arguably the strongest athlete, uh, athletic department in Pinellas County. Uh, Pinellas County has never had a high school that uh, has won a state championship at any level. 
uh, and CCC has come uh, pretty close several times. Um, but I wanted to give, a, and, and the number of their seniors received um, scholarships in several different sports. Uh, but I wanted to give a specific shout out to Elizabeth Mendina, who is the uh, International Baccalaureate Valedictorian. Uh, she is uh, going to be attending Princeton in the fall. And also uh, Lindsay Harrison, who is the uh, Valedictorian in AP and Honors. And Lindsay was also the MVP of the volleyball team. And she will be attending um, the alma mater of Deneen, uh, the University of Florida, uh, in the fall. <laughs> That's very cool. Yet another episode where our listeners do, do not learn the story of Deneen. <laughs> <laughs> Who was she uh, going to be a shout out? I'm happy to report it is now in written form. If you'd like to see that, I have it. Ooh, la la. Uh, I will give a shout out to Tampa General Hospital and my employer, the American Cancer Society. We are partnering to have a information, not disinformation session about how COVID-19 is impacting the lives of cancer patients. Uh, that'll be on Facebook Live. You can go to the American Cancer Society, Facebook Florida page, and it'll be Thursday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. I invite all you to join us, and, and especially if you are um, on a cancer journey, uh, you can learn uh, what's myth and what's real about the challenges you face uh, as a cancer patient, uh, as someone who most likely has a compromised immune system. So again, that's on the ACS Florida Facebook page one to two o'clock on Thursday. And that's my shout out disguised as a shameless self-promotion. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, I, because of the upcoming holiday Memorial Day, I would like to thank the families of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice so we can be free to have conversations like we have on this show and that we can continue to try and bring good dialogue and discourse into the world because protecting freedom of speech and our constitution is truly the cornerstone of who we are. So to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice, um, we are all thinking of you and, um, and honoring you and, and thank your families because, it is, it is truly, truly the beyond, beyond the pale. <laughs> uh, we want to thank our very special guests, power couple, doctors Yael and Paul Lieber for joining us on this episode of Dishonorable Mention. I want to thank everyone for being a part of the podcast. And, uh, you know, I have nothing but love for you guys. And now it's time for us to say goodbye. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.